All right, welcome to this Friday's episode of MVP Real Estate Podcast. We have a very, very local real estate investor with us, with Karina. She is actually in the same town of Oconomowoc as I am, but she is about 10 minutes north, which is about as big as our town is. So <laughs> welcome to the show digitally, even though we probably could be sitting in the same room. Season three, episode I, yeah. nine. Season three, episode nine. I forgot the, <laughs> I forgot the, to timestamp us here. I'm sorry. Oh, Worst host ever. <laughs> But welcome to the show, and uh, thanks for giving us the time here on this gray Friday. You know, it's great to be back here again. Thank you so much for having me again. I feel like it's been already maybe two years since I was here, but I think, I, I, so. think I think it's funny that you and I are so close together, but we still do this digitally every time. Like one of these times, we should really do it in person. <laughs> I know, and this is honestly proof of all the people that get into real estate investing, and people tell them like, "Oh, it's saturated. There's nothing left." We have worked real estate in the same town doing almost the same thing because you do buy and hold real estate and we have never crossed paths on a single deal. So for proof to anybody, we we live yeah. in a town of 15,000 people that have never crossed paths. There's enough deals out there for everybody. <laughs> yeah, so, and I also feel like networking and stuff, we don't even cross paths. It's like, I'm in so many geographical things. It's like, I'm surprised I haven't seen you. <laughs> I know. And I saw that you're on the board of the apartment committee. You're, you're a premier member with bigger pockets. These are all things that I want to get into and uh, bigger pockets. Yes. The forum is huge. Um, but usually they try to geolocate and I don't think I've come across your name on bigger pockets. Disclaimer. We've only been pro members and don't judge us for like three <laughs> or four months. So it was one of those things that took a while to get on board with, but I've always been checking forums and listening to podcasts, but we didn't actually jump in the boat until a couple months ago. But how long have you been a member in Bigger Pockets? Because that is a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, you know, gosh, I have been on there, I'm going to say probably since like 2017, 2016, probably. Um, okay. I, it was... It's changed so much. And I'm not going to be one of the people that says it's changed for the worst. There's a lot of people say, oh, it's too commercial now. But um, it is a different vibe. But I was just so enthralled from the get-go of just how much information was there and how much of a close community it felt like. And even kind of still feels like today. But I remember when the podcast was hosted by Josh Dorkin and Brandon Turner. Mm -hmm. Like, those two were amazing together. But um, I've been a premium member at for pretty much, I want to say my entire time that I've been on there. I did it because the calculators on there, those are the first calculators I ever used for my deals was actually using their rental calculators on there. But then I also used it because I do have the property management company. So in order to like have a signature with your logo in it, you had to be a, I think a premium member. So I went ahead and did it. It's a business expense, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a good idea. And all of the tools on there, we are still going through the webinars and the trainings and everything. We just did one yesterday on Invelo, which is off-market property investing. So that also got us onto the train of thought of we either need to get like a Zapier or a Make, like a automated processor. I don't know if you work with one of those, but during that webinar, they kept talking about how automation will make your life easier, which obviously we've heard that from the beginning of starting your own business. Um, but we haven't had any software system that would handle that. So that got us looking into that yesterday. So they upsold us and it worked. <laughs> but the the information about Invelo was, was great. The automation it can do to touch 300,000 people plus with email campaigns or phone calls and break it down into such a niche scope that you're looking for. I thought was super cool. Cause as you know, all real estate investing is different, whether you go single family, multifamily, the two to four or commercial five and up, uh, all numbers are run differently. Your the way you think about the deal needs to be different. So Karina, in your investing, where do you kind of fall in? Why did you decide to invest in that uh, subsect of real estate? Sure. So uh, I fall in the small multifamily right now. That's all of what I own is small multifamily. Uh, I grew up, I grew up with real estate investors and I, it was the type of investing that they did. My dad also did large 
multifamily. Um, I think at one point he owned a couple of 16 units and maybe a 20 unit, if I remember correctly. Um, but for me, growing up with investors very close to me that did that, that type of investing, like they sort of preach to you their way. Not, not in a bad way, but they're talking about how you have more doors that are paying your mortgage. You have more doors that are paying for that roof, more doors paying for that parking surface. Uh, so for that reason, I did start out in small multifamily and my heart lies, but I was talking with my investing partner and this market might challenge us to either look at single family homes because there's more on the market or possibly have to get very strong with our own marketing campaign just because it's so slim pickings right now. And that's mm -hmm. going to stay that way for a while just because of the economic conditions right now. Yeah. I'm going to let Dan speak on that one. He is our, our front man for research in, in analytics for properties. And what we're seeing is slim pickings on the multifamily. Yeah, the, there's the single family homes are they're still elevated for prices. So if you can try I, to find your numbers to work, but I'm not I don't want to steal it from Dan. What do you know? You're 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 saying everything that I would. It's I don't know, maybe a handful of two families that are two family or multifamily units in the area that we had selected out. And there's even less that even meet the criteria that we're looking for. But where I've expressed or explained to you before is we're looking MLS and we're looking on market. So we have to get creative and get off market or I just for experience, I wanted to get either a seller financing or subject to under my belt. I just want to see how, see how that whole process goes. And in, if it's as fun or uh, attractive as some of the people that I've followed on social media and seen. So uh, that that's um, a challenge that I'm giving us or myself to try to find. Um, I think once, once I find a property that works, I think we'll have, it'll be fairly easy for us to negotiate or manage that. And, you know, they, they'll be our bank. So we don't have to worry about traditional financing or commercial financing. Yeah, that's subject to, I don't know, Karina, if you've heard of Pace, is it Mobley? Mobley? I think he's I've on bigger. You can't, you don't recognize the name? Don't he was on Bigger Pockets. He's big on subject to, um, he's very big on social media too. So if you put in Pace real estate, he will be the name that pops up. But he is all subject to, all of his deals have been done through subject to, that's how he's built his companies. And I don't know if he still has the claim of never putting a single dollar into any real estate deals, just doing them all subject to. But, so it's so, an impressive, impressive feat. What my thing is, is if you're doing a subject to, don't you have to make it worthwhile or attractive for the current homeowner? Like, don't you give them a down payment or something? Or does he get yeah. hard money from somebody else to put into the subject to? Yeah, he'd, he'd give him a down payment, sometimes more than what it traditionally would, where it'd be 20%. Right. So their benefit is is cash in hand. But Pace has done so many videos on that exact topic of what is their benefit. Yeah. Um, and I've actually, I've <clears throat> unpacked a box I got from my dad because he had done uh, rent to own real estate back in the day. And he had some flashcards and there was a stack of flashcards on land contracts or subject to. Mm -hmm. And I'm going through and, and there were a couple of flashcards on that exact topic too. For him getting as big as he is, or obviously he he's having a bunch of success, I wonder if he's come across any subject to houses that he's purchased that the bank calls the mortgage due, and what does he do then? Um, and because, I don't know if it's him, but they do have mortgage insurance. So, but so, like if if the if the current bank of the mortgage finds out that they've done a quit claim deed on the property. They can call the mortgage due within 30 or 90 days, and he's got to pay that in full to the current mortgage holder. And, and I don't want to speak out of context, right. but I'm pretty sure he is the one that's that informed me of of mortgage insurance. So you'd you'd buy a insurance policy for fifteen hundred bucks. Okay. If the bank does call that due, that insurance company will take over 
the loan and you just assume the loan with them. Oh, so it's okay. kind of your, your uh, safety net. I don't, Kareen, have you heard of anything like that? Uh, Cause I knew. You know Sorry, you go. Uh, I was going to say, you know, I, I, I've done, I have actually built technically all, all my portfolio on subject twos. Um, my experience has been even when the bank has found out, which there was one of them they found out. And I don't remember exactly how they found out. I'm trying to remember now. That was so long ago. But basically they looked at it as, okay, you've been paying. That hasn't changed. Property's still being maintained. Uh, so I think ultimately they kind of said, well, we're okay with it. Especially because the loan like at that point only had like, I want to say three years left on it. Okay. Oh, okay. So, because we bought stuff that had majority of it already paid. And there was just under less than like, I think 10 years left on the highest one. So for them to call the mortgage due, they're pretty much just taking all their profit out if they were to cancel it. Because your mortgage was paid and now it's your interest and yeah, I right. guess your profit. So that's that's super cool that you've gotten a subject too. How do you How do you go about finding those deals? We're not there yet. So we're not trying to steal your thunder. I know we're in Oconomowoc. No. But as you were doing those subject to properties, did you find those on the market? Did you look off market and do like an email campaign? No, actually, you know, I got to be really honest here. So first off, we wouldn't, um, I'm, I invest actually over in Janesville. That's where all my properties are right now. Oh, nice. Okay. So um, that was a market that we were interested in because at that time it was going through a downfall, which means inevitably it'll go through an upswing. And if we can mm -hmm. buy on the downfall, we'll be better up on the upswing. But uh, that part, that, that particular portfolio, it all came from basically word of mouth um, connections that our parents had. They were trying to, uh, colleagues of theirs were trying to offload properties. Uh, they were not MLS worthy. And that was sort of the issue was that the, unfortunately they had property managers that were very derelict in how they were taken care of. And so they had gotten a few listing prices from a couple agents. They were like, this isn't even worth it. They were totally like just, dis just dissatisfied. And so long story short, basically what happened was they ended up getting together with my parents for some reason. And at that time, my brother and I were looking to get into it. And so my dad approached us and said, hey, if you want these, you could probably do something called a subject to or a seller financing deal. And my brother and I were like, okay, well, what's that? Explain it. Like we didn't know anything. Yeah. Like I hadn't even heard that yet because this is before bigger pockets or anything. So my dad ended up coming with us to kind of meet with them and he kind of like sat in the background and just sort of like did the whole I'm watching this to see if you go really really wrong with this other than this I'm just gonna like sit in the background <laughs> and so we ended up uh, making arrangements where we bought uh, basically four properties across the two deals and uh, we agreed upon you know the terms of like the interest rate and we agreed upon the terms of any sort of down payment which luckily for us um, they weren't really requiring any sort of down payment uh, which was good because we knew from the get-go we were going to have to be really aggressive with how we address the property issues because we're talking about property issues that likely could have ended up in the hands of the city as violations. So it wasn't just like, oh, this hasn't been fixed for a while. No, this is like, I'm surprised you don't have the city's attention yet. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So we got really lucky in the sense of because there was this connection, uh, there wasn't a lot of strict guidelines for how this was going to go down, what the negotiations were going to look like. And this is something Brandon Turner's talked about. He's like, if you have somebody that you know, that's looking to offload a rental property, the chances of getting favorable terms for you are exponentially greater because yep. you have a relationship, you have a connection somehow. So in that instance, we really benefited from that because they sort of came to the table and was like, okay, well, what do you want the terms to look like? They were just focused on making sure they got a little bit more than they would from the MLS and just being sure that they were going to end up with the properties somehow back in their hands in worse condition. But I don't know if that would have been possible. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> like it. <laughs> it sounds like they were pretty bad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so their big their big need or want out of the deal was uh, the overall price. Yes. So you ended up paying a higher price, but no money out of your pocket. Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and then we act... We actually had very, very low interest on that. We had, it was less than 2% interest. Wow. Yeah. And right now, like things are creeping up to eight. So that is amazing. Yeah. Even when the market was great and people were buying, it was at three. Yeah. So you've got amazing deals. 
the capital that you didn't put down for your down payment through a traditional mortgage, is that what you use to renovate? Yeah, that's what we use to start. Um, I don't like to say renovate because I like to make that apply to the interior. First, we started with the exterior, the stuff that was obviously going to get the city's attention very easily driving by. So yep. that money went into fixing porch railings that were broken or not to code or like fixtures that were hanging with wires exposed, those sorts of things from the exterior. Because then they start to pay less attention to you because municipalities only get yep. into your unit if somebody makes a complaint. Yep. <laughs> so. <laughs> yep. And if it looks good from the street, we're going through right now, we're going to get a conditional use to put a duplex in a, a zoning where it's traditionally just single family homes. Okay. And their qualification is you need to make the street view, make it look like a single family home. But on the interior, if it's a duplex, it's a duplex. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it was kind of cool. So yeah. that's the design process we're working with. But to your point, as long as it looks good from the street, you have you buy yourself a little bit of time. Yes. So you go and you fix up the exterior. Was the interior able to be rented during that? Or is that where you had to keep it vacant? So everything actually, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember here. Everything came to us occupied. So there okay. weren't any vacancies with either of the deals. We made one vacancy right away because we had, we knew there were going to be issues with this particular tenant because she was really sort of sporadic with her rent and she was already like a month and a half behind to the current owner before we closed. So right off the bat, we made ourselves a vacancy because everyone else had very good payment history, but this one person in this one unit. So really our approach was after that person was removed, we did do um, some good work on the inside. Still didn't do like a full renovation on that one. We still kept the cabinets that were there, that sort of thing. We did we did flooring. Um, we did a little bit of bathroom remodel in the sense of the vanity and stuff like that, but nothing too large scale. And then we really just foc focused on cultivating good relationship with the existing tenants, knowing that if we were nice to them and we at least address some of their stuff timely that we could kind of tide it over until we got to be able to do larger things in their units or a lot more of their concerns. Yeah. Obviously you can't do the whole rehab when tenants are in there. So creating a vacancy to get in and, and do the rehab you need to on a unit sometimes is necessary. It's obviously not a fun process and I'm sure that tenant was not happy to hear the news. But in order for you to get your building up and running, um, it's kind of a necessity, which mm -hmm. stinks. Um, so then you've renovated the exterior, you, you renovated <clears throat> what you needed to for that vacant unit. When you got it fully occupied again, did you go to get traditional lending or are you still on that same agreement with the sellers? Uh, or how so did the financials work on that one? So we actually kind of kicked ass in the sense of, um, so nice. we, our, our distinct plan was we just wanted to get free and clear of our obligations to the sellers, but we didn't want to necessarily have to go through traditional financing. Um, because the history of the properties is a little complicated, which I'm not going to get into on here just for the sake of the seller yeah. and the previous owner confidentiality. So it wouldn't necessarily been the greatest option to go over and do a sort of like traditional on those properties just because of the history before us. So we actually, after we got like the exterior stuff done, like, okay, city's not going to pay too much attention to us. Um, then what we ended up doing was just paying extra towards them and getting them off so that now every one of the owners is completely out of the picture. And the other one, we only have, well, the way we divide up is a little crazy, but we have one property left with them that has a payment on it. Okay. And that one's going to be done. I want to say- 2024 like june of 2024 nice so coming up pretty pretty quickly then yeah yeah pretty quickly yep and then and that was purchased in 2016 you said 2013 2013 oh, wow. okay so bought yeah. you three more years but that's still an impressive schedule to get on to pay yeah. off the house or the house <laughs> is yeah we got we got really lucky in the sense of um for the most part we had very steady tenants uh so that made it easier, even though the rents were drastically under market, like no joke. When we took them on most, most of the market rates were like 150 below market rate per month. Really? Um, 
Yeah, but we still were, I guess, lucky in the sense of tenant expectations were a little low based on what they've been through. So we were able to kind of scroll away cash, but then also pay down the notes much, much sooner. Yeah. yeah. And that is important because that I'm sure helped you into your next deal. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, honestly, you know, the, the, those, those two kind of came close together later, later, like within a three-year period of each other, running those two okay. deals together. Um, and for a couple of reasons, we haven't done anything since then, which is really kind of sad. It really is hundred percent sad because um, I got distracted being also a property manager and three other, 30 other things that I'm doing. Um, yeah. So it just, it's one of those things where we got so focused on maintaining that portfolio and building it up that we lost track of this idea of building. And our dad actually just called us out on this. Like, I want to say about a year Ooh. and a half ago. Yeah. <laughs> dad never forgets. No, no, he never does. He's like, you guys haven't bought anything in a while. He's like, plus you've got this equity sitting there. I'm like, I know, I know we're, we're kind of working on that. I promise we are. <laughs> 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 and, and is he talking about buying stuff for that property or buying another property? Some of buying more properties because okay. even when he does the math, he's like, you guys have enough equity build out to go and buy like four or five more duplexes. Just go and do it. Yeah. Without is there some hesitancy with the market right now? Because I know on our side, it, it there is a little bit of that tension of like, what what is to come? What's mm -hmm. going to happen? So where do you sit on that fence of, all right, we're looking to invest a bunch of more money with the uncertainty of what's going to happen? You know, 20, uh, latter part of 2020, 2021, and most of 2022, we were really gun ho Like I was really trying, but there was like everybody and their mother and their grandmother trying to buy at that time. So it yeah. was incredibly <laughs> yeah. difficult. So like I, there, there was a little bit of this, like, I'm just exhausted. I'm going to sit in the back for a while. And then now I'm kind of realizing that, okay, things are starting to show up where there's going to be less competition. Although there is less availability, there's less competition. But I'm also realizing that with the general degree of where the country's going, the direction of how it's going with certain conversations about rental regulations and stuff like that, that a lot of the people who have cold feet, inexperienced, they're kind of like really, truly starting to back off. Like, like, whoa, what's all this conversation about? Which means that really the people that are left eventually pretty soon are going to be those of us that are like, if you bleed us, we bleed real estate. Yeah. Like, those are the people that are going to be left. All the people that are sort of like, oh, this sounds like a really great idea. They're getting scared off already by the higher interest rates. They're getting scared off by all the chit chat or possible regulations being passed in their area about rent control, things like that. And they're like, oh, this isn't for me anymore. So I really am still trying to get in there this year, but I am recognizing that number one, I need to be on my A game as far as off-market deals. I need to be very active in Facebook groups. I need to be networking, letting people know that I'm looking. And then also, I guess to the third point, we're actually going to start doing our own marketing campaign for the first time ever. Nice. Um, done a ton of research on this. I've helped other people put together marketing campaigns, which sounds really dumb, but <laughs> as a real estate coach, I've helped other people put together marketing campaigns, but I've never actually gone ahead and done one. So we're looking at doing one this year. Uh, I know a lot of people use traditional mailers, uh, sort of things to do these things. I am a social media person through and through the bang for your buck that you get by devoting, let's say $60 in social media, I can get more traction with that than $60 in mailers by and far. Yeah. So we're going to be focusing on doing a social media campaign rather than the traditional mailer. Okay. So are you using the things in just because you're a bigger pockets member, they have all those tools and those automated, uh, like they have MailChimp, I think integrated. Um, what is their other, their email campaign? I forgot what the brand or the company is. But are you using something like that in order for this email campaign to run? Or are you manually running this? No, she said social media. So like Facebook or Instagram. Oh, the Instagram. Right. Okay, right, right. okay. I got yeah. you. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So we're just going to be using, um, specifically, we're doing Facebook. And gotcha. then we also, we're looking at Google AdWords, uh, just trying to see how much it's going to pay off though. Um, it seems like the biggest bulk of our budget is going to be in Facebook. Because 
we are going to be including a little bit of the single family homes like inherited, you know, your grandparents died, unfortunately, or somebody died. You don't know what to do with it. Yeah, We're going to be focusing on that sort of stream and Facebook really seems to pay off for that. Yeah. No, in all of the forums in Facebook is great access. I don't know how real estate investors did it before without social media. <laughs> like I know bigger pockets in 2015, 2014, when I started listening, like the one big thing they were talking about is all of the connections you want to make are there on social media. You have Facebook, you have forums. They would obviously plug the bigger pockets forum, which has grown so much more than when I started listening. Um, and that's like your free audience. Yes, you can put money into boosting the post like you were referencing, putting 60 bucks in and getting a lot more touches on that post. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a definite different way to look at it because I started with the typical mailer like you're talking about through, again, another referral from Bigger Pockets, which was Deal Machine. So I would just take a picture. It would go through the tax record and find the home of the owner and then send out a mailer every three months or two months, whatever I'd set it to. But it gets yeah. clunky. It gets super clunky. It's hard to gauge your response rate. Um, so going online, I like that idea. And do you have like everything planned? Or are you in the planning stages of what is our message or who are we going to go after? And can you break down your thought process of who you'd want to target? Sure. In this market of what you're going for? Yeah. So um, specifically, the first one we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a multifamily one. Uh, the issue with that one, why we're not necessarily in love with it is because we feel like that's a smaller pond. We all know this is a smaller pond. Like when we look at it, there's much more single family homes in the world than there are small multifamily. Mm -hmm. So we have a smaller pond that we're going to be trying to fish in. And that's literally what we're doing is fishing because we don't know we're going to catch anything. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> you're fishing in this smaller pond. You're also fishing in a pond that you already know people feel pretty good about where they're at because they bought like in the last two years with super low interest rates. So yep. our messaging for that one has to be specifically for the people that somehow managed to over leverage themselves in that time frame. That's what that message needs to be. Because if you're not targeting those people that are starting to feel like they're underwater, a general campaign for multifamilies isn't going to go anywhere right now because we had such stellar interest rates. Like if you wanted to buy, you really did two years ago if you were, you know, yep. a gladiator that ended up on top of the mountain, you know, you're able to actually find something by selling your firstborn child, then great, you have your property. <laughs> you're not going to offload it like anytime soon because of that phenomenal interest rate. Yeah. So we're doing that one. We're, I'm not extremely optimistic about its success. Uh, but of course I say that and I shouldn't be saying that because really we should be believing in anything that we do. Cause there's this whole idea of, you know, you come back and get what you put out in the world or what you think. So, yeah, but we're more excited really about sort of the single family home one, just because of the idea that there is more out there. Um, not necessarily, uh, a desert as much as we're going to see with the multifamily one. Um, also just the idea that it, it opens up horizons for us. So you purchase a single family home, you can make it an Airbnb, you can make it a, a, a nurse's oasis, as I tend to call those ones for traveling nurses. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility in, in, in what you do with a single family home versus a, a duplex. Generally, I still feel a little weird about mingling short term and other people together in the same building. So I like the idea that there's flexibility and it's sort of like a blank slate situation with a single family home. Yeah. So two questions with, you said primarily being in the Janesville area, what, what is the draw there? And I'm, I'm not speaking ignorantly. I know it's a little far from, not too far from Whitewater, maybe half an hour. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. With right. it, with it being there, like what is the draw for STRs there? Um, so when I, so first thing I should make this clear, like we aren't just targeting Janesville, um, yeah, okay. for, for our marketing campaigns, we really have decided we're rather indiscriminate as far as our markets. Like there are some we're not going to touch. Um, we're not going to touch Madison, Dane County because of its insane regulations. We're not going to touch Milwaukee County for the same exact reason. Um, so when we're doing a marketing right campaign, there with you. <laughs> 
Yes, like both of those counties have a very large history of just being very much in your face and a lot of red tape, a lot of regulations. So those are two we automatically just said no. But other than that, we're not really being, you know, we're really being sort of open with our market. So okay. we're okay with doing Jefferson or, you know, Janesville or even Kenosha and we're seeing because I have connections there. I have people there. That's me. <laughs> That's where I'm at. I'm oh, like, okay. I'm like just north of the Racine Kenosha border. So I'm like two minutes from, from KR. So. Oh yeah. Okay. So like, California, um, kind of, yeah. yeah. And the other question is like when, and I don't know why this randomly popped in my head, but like when you're targeting, whether that's through the, the Facebook ads, if you can maybe partner with, um, a state sale planners, and use them as like, hey, we can provide this service for you. We can line you up with a, an estate planner or a state, a state sale planner. And then we can discuss what your plans are with the property after that estate sale has been com concluded. Because in that unfortunate circumstance where someone has to go through an estate sale and set that all up, obviously they're looking to get what they can out of all of the sale of the belongings but then also then the residents so they you would think they might be more willing to offload that property if they're having an influx of cash as well from all the belongings that were within the property mm -hmm. it's just a random thought i don't know if it'd be a good yeah. idea for some type of a tight tight message to you know convey that hey anybody that has you know lost a loved one or whatever and looking to offload you know do the sale and then yeah i don't know yeah Just that reminds me yeah. of the the relationship with with obviously financial advisors or brokers those are the two people that know they're dealing with investors and they'll probably be one of the first ones to know if they're going to off offload a property mm -hmm. so if someone's going into retirement and they're like i'm done owning real estate i'm done being a property manager i need to sell this multifamily it is not a okay tomorrow we're going to list it your your financial advisor is not doing a good job if he tells you, okay, just list the house tomorrow. There's prep that goes into it so that you can avoid your taxes. So making that connection with those brokers, with those financial advisors, those will be nice eyes and boots on the ground for properties that are going to be moving soon. And I don't know if that's kind of what you're alluding to with this campaign. Yeah, with, I, I, uh... I... Sorry, you can go, Karina. I think there's a very valid point in what, and what Dan said, it actually reminds me of something that someone I call my real estate brother said to me. Um, I call my real estate brother because his dad and my dad worked a lot together on like state politics and changing law and stuff like that. So we kind of grew up together. But we were at a conference a couple of years ago together and we were having drinks. And he said, you know, one, one thing people don't understand about niches is like no matter what your niche is, whether it be, you know, uh, homes have to be sold because somebody died or somebody's in divorce or um, maybe they're just uh, wanting to relocate or whatever it is. He's like every niche that people have, there are people that you could be networking in that service that particular niche that could be helping you find deals or could be putting you in the front lines of people that deal with them before they would come to you. Mm -hmm. so whether it be divorce attorneys you know you're networking with divorce attorneys you know if that's what yep. you want to do or you're networking with uh people that are I, I i and this is something i i didn't even know existed but i learned from this conversation that the people that exist that basically get paid to be um power of attorneys for people and those are people that you can connect with and be like hey you know what when it comes time when this unfortunate thing happens let me know i have these connections so on and so forth so i like this idea that no matter what niche you're in there's people you can network in to help you get into that niche even deeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they'll honestly lead you to your, the connections, the ultimate connections that you're looking for. Yes. And, and the hard thing is finding them and taking the time to build those relationships. Just like you take the time and the money to put into your properties to fix them up. You need to put time and energy into making those connections. Cause in these markets where it, the inventory is low, and there's a bunch of investors or buyers out there. Like you were referring to early in the show, your leverage on your terms of those deals are already super low. So if you can make the relationship and get your foot in the door, at least that's the start. Because a, a, the big challenge is being the first one or being a, a, a good qualified buyer that they would respect you. You'd be a, hey, we're going to bring you to the table because we know you can close. 
what they don't want to do is bring an investor in who they've never worked with before. Uh oh. And then like, oh yeah, I don't actually like the deal. I just wasted my time. I wasted my client's time because that buyer didn't end up buying it. So it's like a, a very fine line of um, a business relationship that, I don't know, it's finicky, I guess. It is. You know, relationships are stuff you need to cultivate over time. Mm -hmm. One of the things my dad always told me is that relationships are like a garden. Like you plant the seed so early on, but it takes years for it to grow and sort of bring anything back to you possibly, but it's absolutely worth it. Because those seeds that you plant, as long as you maintain that garden, you remind them that you exist, and maybe every once in a while you help them get what they need, it's going to come yep. back to you Yeah, at some point. It will. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and with this email campaign that you're going out, are you looking at the subject to option again? Uh, so for the social media campaign, um, we're not going to be sort of discriminate in saying that we only want to handle these types of deals. Um, we're going to be open to whatever, just because we have sort of a multi, a multiple exit strategy with me being a realtor, uh, me having property management clients that even if it's not our sort of cup of tea, it might be somebody else's. So for that reason, we're not necessarily trying to pinpoint a specific type of financing that we want to obtain out of this. Okay. So not pigeon your whole yourself into one niche thing it's kind of case by case basis if this property will do subject to you're interested or open to the idea yes but willing to go with traditional uh finance. Just looking for good deals exactly yeah. yep yep and then you're if we on. can't use them then we have other ways to make them useful for us or for me so yeah and with you being an agent obviously that is a very symbiotic relationship do you find that you within your analytics of looking for properties, find one that you can pass on to a client easily? Or has it ever been like a, <laughs> excuse me, um, I don't want to call it a true wholesale, but where you got the lead because you were interested in this property, but you turned out that your client was looking and you just passed it to them. Was there any sort of like chain of command or anything like that? Uh, you know, I'll be honest, the way that I kind of run it is I don't, I don't really get into wholesaling even in that aspect. Um, so all of my existing property management clients, I have a good relationship with, it, with them where even if I wasn't their original real estate agent, if I bring them something, they will use me to close on it. Oh, okay. So, um, and for me, I like that because that's a lot less complicated. I, me being a licensed agent, I'm not too keen on that gray area where wholesaling kind of puts me. Yep. I like my license. I like to keep it. So yep. I don't want to tear it up. So I'd rather not quite get into this whole aspect of wholesaling personally for me. Yeah. And I'm the same way. I, I love wholesaling, but being a licensed agent, it scares me. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you're held to like that different standard that if you don't do one thing right, the hammer is a lot worse on you and I than Dan. Dan is not a licensed agent. Thanks. So you can you can play in that gray area, Dan. Yeah. Well, there, there's actually a lot of people that I know where there's, they, they, they invest together and if they ever do wholesaling, the agent is never a part of it. It's the other partner that does that. Like there's this veil between them yep. and that's a really good strategy. It is. Yeah. And I look on that the same side as the building being a general contractor. Like there are some corners you can cut and there are some corners that I can absolutely not cut. Because it, it goes by the you know better rule. Yes. Like you're licensed and you know better. So don't do it. So exactly. in those moments, I don't do it. Yeah. It's not I, worth it. There's so many things that's not worth it for a license. And then even as just in real estate investors, even if you aren't licensed in anything, you have to understand people expect us to know more. And that includes the judges, the cities and everything. They expect you to know more because you're doing this for a life, for a profession. They expect you to act professionally, which means you know your rules, you know your regulations. So you don't have the excuse of, oh, I didn't know, or, oh, I didn't think you'd catch me on it. Ignorance yeah. <laughs> is in a defense. Yes, exactly. Yep. Especially in this industry. Right. <laughs> yeah. The ask for forgiveness does not work in that scenario. No. No, no. Um, which is I, like the, the banking scenario where you had, where you went through with the sale and then the bank would find out. In yep. those cases, usually you can ask for forgiveness. Yes. And in that scenario where you were in directly, they said, okay, we'll still honor it. 
Uh, not so much. You don't get that the warm and fuzzies from the city usually. No, and 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 not from the judges because I've actually before I started um, using somebody else to do a couple evictions that I have done. Uh, I remember I went in the morning one time. This was probably like 2016, 2015. I went in the morning. I sat, waited my turn, and everything. And the case right before me, the landlord got absolutely reamed by the judge. Like I felt uncomfortable sitting in my chair because basically what happened was that the judge had asked for a copy of the lease and they presented the lease and he's going through the lease. He's seen all these things that are illegal. It's like, this is illegal. This is illegal. This is illegal. And the landlord says, well, sorry, your honor, I drafted my own lease and I didn't know. And I'm like, oh, you didn't just say that. <laughs> no. The famous final words. Right. It, it, it was, it was because then it was just, he's like, bailiff, go and get this exact book. And it was the Wisconsin way, which at that time was up to date. And it gave you all the rules and regulations. And he tells the bailiff to slam it on the table in front of the plaintiff to oh, make no. sure that they know this book existed. He's like, you have to go home and read this. And I'm like, I have to follow you. And you just upset the judge. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> Thanks a lot, jerk. <laughs> Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> Luckily it turned out okay for me. Cause I, I know my ABCs and everything else. So, wow. but and if you've ever <laughs> sat in those meetings, uh, obviously I don't know what municipality that was in maybe Janesville, but mm -hmm. the ones I've gone to, you're not in a room of like 300 people where you get lost in the crowd. Like you're there with the 10 people that are on the docket for that meeting. So it's a very intimate thing. So when somebody gets reamed out and you're going right behind them, uh, it there's an anxiety that builds in you where you're like, oh man, now all the, the panel, the board is upset. Like the yep. city council is now all upset. <laughs> I went to one, uh, man, and I have to be very, because it's in Oconomowoc. There was one where they were building a commercial building and the owner was at the the city council meeting going over his plans and this was supposed to be the final one where they got approval and they could start breaking ground and he used the word tower and the city council lost it there was no going past that he said tower and the municipality hates towers it was a two-story building but he said tower <laughs> and it was done it was gone at that point he had to sign up for the next meeting which was like a month later yeah because of one word, I luckily was like four after him. So they had cooled down, but I did feel bad for that next person. Cause he had an uphill battle. He was trying to divide lots and they already weren't, they didn't want anything new at that point. Yeah. So it's, it is true. And it's a flip of a coin of where you go. I have one on Thursday and we're seventh. We're the last one. Yeah. Sometimes yep. you just have to address the, the, te the tension or the awkwardness, either make a light joke about it or something. And you, you, I mean, you could have started the conversation right after that person with the Wisconsin wave, but like, I've read that front to back. I know everything in it. Test, <laughs> and it just, I mean, almost could be a you know smart aleck about it, but like, test me, you know, whatever. And, you know, lighten the mood or something. I mean, because everybody knows that that awkwardness or that tension's there. I mean, even the judge has to know that he's creating uh, not a hostile environment, but a more tense situation and just address it head on and move past it. I mean, I, Mm -hmm. you know sometimes people are awkward or whatever and push hopefully right they have it, good man. humor right it, i mean yeah. you yep. you would you would hope so yeah because yeah. the judge actually asked me like after we got through our preliminary he's like are you familiar with wisconsin way i'm like actually your honor my dad helped write it so, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty familiar with it. he's like oh all right <laughs> yeah if i have any questions i'll call my dad right? did he yeah, offer you yeah. the gavel after that he's like here you can take my job <laughs> <laughs> i so i saw the same judge oh, like about i don't know two years maybe at like some networking event and he remembered me i didn't i, I didn't remember him and he was like i'm pretty sure you 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 could probably teach me some things because he learned who my dad was since then and i'm like oh yeah there's my there's, there's my dad's reputation sort of like following me and preceding right. me and and then if the judge actually asked me a couple of things, I'm like, I don't feel comfortable with this. Like back then it really bothered me when judges were coming to me asking for opinion because I felt like I'm real, I'm, I'm still brand new to this. Like I know this stuff, but I'm little old me who's been around for like three years. Why are you asking me this stuff? But mm -hmm. I guess yeah. it kind of comes with the territory when you have a father like I do. People just know the name and then they make the connection. It's like, oh, okay. Yep. Here we are. <laughs> yep. You're locked into it. 
I am. You yes, have the yep. forever you know better, licensed or not. Right. Exactly. That's exactly, especially in Janesville, because that's where he did all of his investing. So his name still is prevalent there. And it's like, yep, people make the connection and then it's just done. <laughs> yeah. That is, that's, I mean, there's a, it's a double edged sword because I would love to have your dad as a resource. If I had questions, I could call him up who's had decades and decades of knowledge. So that is for sure a benefit. And I'm sure you're feeling the, both the benefit and the the negative, I guess. Oh yeah. Cause just that. like I said, like he, he just reminded us like, why haven't we bought anything yet? So there is a lot of the positive then every once in a while, there's that, there's that negative. But, yeah. You know, most recently I called him because I needed his advice for property manager. I just felt like I needed to remove this client, like in the past year or so I called him. I'm like, I just, this client feels like a drain on me. And like, I want to make sure I'm making the right decision here by, you know, removing them. Cause he also was a property manager and it was good to have that sounding board. Somebody who's been there, not in that exact position, but then he also knows me really well. And so he says, you know, you have too much potential to be tied up by this particular person. Yeah. You need to get rid of them. Yeah. And that's not a conversation that I will say 80% of America will have to evict a tenant. Like no one's been in that situation. So your dad being close to that is a very, very like, invaluable asset to have because if you go and ask your neighbor like hey when you had to evict a tenant they'd be like what i don't have a rental property so you don't get a lot of feedback from your friends and maybe your family in your case the family one doesn't count um but the person that you can call that say hey give me advice through the situation because that is a very awkward situation and going through it the first time can you walk through like your mental processing as you go through like okay i have to evict this tenant there's the legal side and then there's the human side mm -hmm. of both of this i mean my first property i had to evict it was a foreclosure where i had to go in after the foreclosure sale and technically evict the old homeowners and it's not a joyous time like no one has fun i didn't have fun they weren't having fun it's just a downer moment yeah. so when you, you bought your property, you said, okay, this tenant is obviously not going to be a positive on our, our sheets here. How do we legally go about this? And how do we humanely go about this where we're not like berating them and belittling them just because of the situation? Sure. I guess before I get into this, I will kind of make this disclosure that in a very loving lay way my husband refers to me if anyone's a bob's burgers fan he refers to me as mr fish odor um he is the landlord on bob's burgers and that is my husband referencing the fact that sometimes i go too black and white with things and so my husband can sort of be my tempering person and i have gone to him <laughs> once or twice been like is this really mean because like one time i wanted to issue a tenant a five day like on december 21st he's like Ooh. why Ooh. <laughs> i'm like <laughs> Because I'm Mrs. Fish Odor? I don't know. Like, I just... <laughs> yeah. Well, so... even that, like, if you don't, if you don't time out your notices the same way, there's claims of um, whatever they'd want to do, uh, favoritism. So you don't give it to this person because of that. Why'd you give it to me at this time? And if you don't do it the same way, they've got a claim against you. So part of that is legally, you kind of have to. But well, obviously it, in your situation, share the situation a little bit more. Well, I mean, and well, for that thing, he actually made a valid point because one thing he said was you give it now, like based on court holidays and then also weekends, he's like, you could file January 2nd. If you do this, like January 2nd, you issue it the next business day, you'll be in court like on the 7th. He's like, why? Why do this? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, all right, yeah, fair point. Like I'm just ruining your December, but not being able to file actually in December because of holidays and everything. So anyway, um, getting back to the question, you know, I have, I've been in the industry so long, I have very strict sort of regulations now for my own self, as far as how I do things, you know, um, if I, you know, most of the time I'm entertaining evictions because of money. So I have somebody that owes me rent, you know, I'm very sort of checkpoint with this. So are they a month behind and they haven't had any communication with me? Okay. I'm issuing a five day notice. Um, have they had some communication with me? Are we able to establish a payment plan? Will they agree to a payment plan? They'll get it paid down in no uh, no more than eight weeks. Okay, then we'll go ahead and set this payment plan. But everyone knows that 
everyone gets just one. And if you mess up once, I issue the five day and you have to pay it in full. Um, you know, I don't, I can't make it personal. So I can't look at it and go, oh, well, she has two kids. You know, do I really want to issue a five day right now? Uh, or they're, they're elderly. Do I really want to issue a five day right now? That might be the one where I really do hesitate. I got to admit, I don't know why, but I have a soft spot, I guess there, but I have to yeah. remind myself, judges expect you to treat everybody the same because mm -hmm. otherwise you get into discrimination yep. accusations. So to a certain extent, you do have to treat everyone the same. Otherwise you could find yourself on the side of pot or fair housing. Yeah. So, um, I issue the five day, you know, depending on what kind of dialogue comes back, what kind of payment comes back. Um, but then honestly, I'm usually filing that five day with my attorney. I, I'd say like the seventh day after it expires. And then once that happens, uh, because I have an attorney now who does everything, they really sort of do take control of it all. They'll ask me questions. Like my attorney asked me for my lease in advance. They get a updated tenant ledger in advance. Uh, and then he always asked me this blanket statement. Is there anything else I should know? And that always refers to, is there any history your attorney should know that you have with this tenant? Any sort of brawls, well, not physical brawls, obviously, hopefully, but um, yeah. any sort of like altercations you've had with them. Uh, any sort of history where you've tried to work with them, payment plans, um, where you've given them a break before. These are all things that if you're hiring an attorney, you want them to know so they can come prepared and say to the judge, hey, your honor, actually, they've been in this position before. My client tried to do this, but it didn't work out. Yeah. Um, I do like to recommend that people hire attorneys to do evictions. Number one, it saves you a ton of time because the way this all works is evictions are always done a particular day of the week and no matter what municipality you are. Uh, and they're always either one or two days, depending on the size of municipality. They're always in the morning. They're always the eight, eight to noon shift. And the way it works is attorneys get first dibs. So attorneys have all their stuff go first. So between eight and nine 30, it's all the attorneys, but you still have to be there at eight, by the way, you cannot walk in like later on because the doors are closed. You only get to leave, but you can't enter. So the other, the other reason I, I highly recommend people get attorneys is because attorneys and judges, they play poker together. They play basketball together. They have yep. a relationship. So if something happens to be a little off, this seems weird, but your attorney's relationship with the judge can make all the difference in how that goes down. Yep. Versus if you were up there with that mistake, it would go a lot differently. So I highly recommend people hire attorneys for evictions for that exact reason, especially if you can find a flat fee attorney. I know it's getting more and more difficult to find a flat fee attorney for evictions, but then it's definitely, definitely worth it because of how much you are protecting yourself in this process. Because an attorney is also going to point out ahead of time that, hey, you actually didn't do this quite correctly. So yeah, we need to redo this and then refile or file at a later date when this expires. Yeah. So I like all these like catches that sort of happen with using an attorney. Yeah. And the attorney is is crucial for those. Um, it's already a, a, a weird scenario. If you layer on top of that any, like you were saying, battles with that tenant, that underlying personal issue, it's... I would say it's almost like um, you're too close to the situation. Yes. Like if you have a best friend who tells you like, hey, don't do that. You're like, yeah, okay. But if it comes from somebody you don't know, it impacts you a little bit more. I don't know why. Like for some reason, that relationship doesn't make it sink in a little bit. So hiring that attorney to offload the personal aspect and just deal with the business is a very, very smart move. And then two, you were talking earlier, like you try to set up the payment plans. You try to get communication. You don't just rely right on the law where you're like, all right, five day notice. I'm not going to reach out. I'm not going to negotiate with you at all. Just here's your notice. Get out. You're like you do try to make them come to the table, negotiate, stay in the place. But mm -hmm. ultimately, if you can't, you've got one option. Um, right. I, and, I think I think that's so crucial in the post COVID world or even the COVID world, like we talk about how landlords get a bad rep, how rental investors get a bad rep. It's by the people who don't try and extend that olive branch in situations. Mm -hmm. And that's where we end up getting overregulated because there's these other people who are just too, too much of a robot rather than a person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And I tell all my tenants, all of, we have an online processor that takes all the rent payments. So everything's online. If you're having trouble or if 
if a paycheck doesn't come and it's not going to come till Monday and you have the first to the sixth to make your payment on the seventh, you get your late fee. So if you tell me on the fifth or sixth, like, Hey, I'm going to be a day late. I have no problem waiving the late fee. But if you don't tell me and it's just sitting out there, you just weren't prepared. And if you're not prepared, I can't help you. But if you can Mm -hmm. communicate with me, the situation that's going on, I'm more than reasonable to allow a, a grace period. But yeah. if it if it happens consecutively, yes, we have to talk different. Yeah, and I'm one of those people where it's like the conversation will go much differently if you approach me before I approach you with the five day. Yes. Or even with my initial late notice, because technically I skipped this, like on the fourth day of the month, we're issuing like very non-legally binding, just, hey, where's your rent? Did you forget sort of automated emails? But if I'm having to contact you and I've already done the five day, if you had contacted me, like even after you got the late, the, you know, the non-binding one, our conversation is going to be much different. Much different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and it goes differently with me because I feel like you have a sense of responsibility and you sort of put on your big girl pants or big boy pants and had this conversation without me initiating it. Yeah. In that, a lot of that, and I'm still early on, so I won't say that this is the end all be all. But having that conversation when you're signing the lease with them, say like, hey, I I can be your friend, but this is a business. It's going to be a blend and nothing I do is personal to you. And if things need to get done, things need to get done. If you need things done, I understand things need to get done. So we have to keep it professional and and not take things personal because sometimes it's just the the nature of you renting. And whenever you're looking to buy a house, I will help you buy a house. Because I think ultimately, I think that would be the overall goal for everybody. So if we look at this rental as a means to an end, and we are trying to get you situated in a house that you can own, like let's work together. And usually in that, you're on the same side of the fence. You guys want to work together. You've got your common goal. A lot of those personal discords are going to bypass. Absolutely. And that's how I frame it with them. Like you're an adult, I'm an adult. Let's both act like it. I mean, basically you frame it like if if you were dealing with a bank, it'd be the same situation. So uh, essentially, worse. well, I'm it'd just saying, worse. but like view me, view me as a bank, right? Like, yeah. or, or you run it through your property management and you never meet your tenants, but then you lose that personal mm-hmm. aspect to it. So you, you, you tell them, Hey, like you said, this is a business. I am essentially your bank. I'm renting this out to you. Let's keep it that way. I mean, I'm I'm gonna be here if you need me, but you have to take the the proactive approach. Yeah. Just like you have to give notice if you want to go in there to either do an inspection or make a repair or do whatever. Yeah. Like let's let's have some reciprocity here. So mm-hmm. yeah. There's actually a big conversation going around right now, especially, well, you mentioned earlier, uh, Marcus, that I'm the chairman of the state organization for landlords in Wisconsin. Uh, So Wisconsin Real Estate Investors used to be Wisconsin Apartment Association, recently did a rebranding. One of the big conversations we're having right now is we're beginning to see more and more about how young renters no longer come to us with the level of knowledge they used to about being an adult. And what, and what we mean by yeah. that is they're not learning in school as much as even I think the three of us here learned about like writing, well, writing checks per se, but, um, you know, making good payments on time, keeping their credit going, how to take out a loan, all these things. They're not learning these things in school anymore. So there is a certain aspect of how we're learning that we might need to educate our young renters on how this all works and how yep. it builds towards their future. You know, you rent to the 18, 19 year old, suddenly you could find yourself in this position of being like a financial mentor. Yep. And it's part of the deal that we have now as investors, because unfortunately the schools, and I guess on a deeper, maybe more personal level, parents have sort of started to fail their kids and getting them ready to be an adult. And if we're gonna be the people renting to these ki- these kids, we're going to be be the ones to teach them because otherwise it's going to suck for us as the investors because it's of course going to affect us. Yeah. So we need to begin to realize that we need to teach some of our renters and we can't just think, Oh, well you should know this and I'm not going to teach you. Well, 
you need to kind of adapt for the times and realize that you need to fill that gap or else what are you going to do? Yeah. Experience yeah. Is, a, is, is a good uh, teacher though. Uh, I, one of my many former jobs, I used to go into schools and run a workshop for financial literacy, financial education. I would have to get approval from the school and then I would have to proactively um, cold drop in on uh, teachers and talk to them and say, hey, I, I do financial literacy. I want to take a half hour, 45 minutes, talk to your class, blah, blah, blah. Uh, is this something you'd be interested in doing? And I did it for a while and I enjoyed doing it because you would be surprised at, I mean, you wouldn't be surprised at their lack of knowledge on simple, like, um, how far their dollar can go, like what they can do with their money if they plan ahead. If it's mm -hmm. not just impulse, 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 you have a better chance of, you know, making sure that they create good habits from the jump. And we're talking 14 to 18 year olds here, right? So mostly high school. So yeah. you go in there, talk to them. And then um, it, it then it turns out like there's after I'm already doing this, then there starts to be red tape with the local financial institutions around here saying, oh, well, we already have a relationship with this bank or this credit union. So we're just going to use them if we have any type of need for financial literacy. And it's like, well, you wouldn't have looked at that avenue had I not been here to discuss this with you wanting to talk to your kids about it. So yeah. uh, I definitely agree. I've seen it firsthand as far as their, their surprise at how interest works or compounding interest. Like when you, when you talk to them about planning for retirement, they're like, that's 50 years away. Why do I have to worry about it? Right. So it's like, you got to set the table now. And if you, if you're not preparing for that, uh, you're going to be going to be in a in a tough spot later on so yeah yeah and me and dan both i didn't work with that company but we had worked previously and i was also in high schools and nonprofits around wisconsin and out of all of the academics that i talked to there was one teacher that he was an economics teacher for junior and seniors and he he saw what you were alluding to um and he had set up a system in his class and it was just for this one economics class. And at the beginning of the semester, everybody got their, their, I'll call it a role. Like you're either a mom or you're a, a married couple, both W2 employment, have two kids. You are a single parent, have three kids. You are salaried, you are hourly. And he would sporadically change it for everybody. And at the beginning of class, attendance was you showing up to work. So if you were hourly, you didn't get paid that day. If you were a salary, you still got your salary. And like it, he literally went by the end of the semester to see where people went and how they, the choices they made to make it as real as possible. Like, are you renting or do you, have you purchased your home? Are you able to take equity out of your home to buy and like all of the scenarios? And I thought that was fascinating. But only one teacher across southeastern Wisconsin is even dabbling in this. Mm. And I wish that that could get taught to more, more economics teachers around the state. Because that little philosophy, I mean, it probably took him months to plan out, but now he just keeps redoing it every year for his students. I thought it was fascinating, like a super good learning moment for all those young kids that have never been in that situation where like, okay, I'm not living at home and now I have to start planning for rent and food in gas and my car payment like it's now i'm building up a little bit rather than and i equate it back to this book i read soft america hard america before you're 18 soft because a lot of the things are done for you but then at 18 it flips and now it's like oh find your way through i mean it, it all goes back to been... the it goes back to the family life though too right so if if there had been those conversations or the the yep. preparation for it, but I'm sure you've seen it when we when you're in schools and you're talking to a team and you're saying, hey, a uh, coach said that you guys need new uniforms and each uniform is ninety bucks a person and you could see their eyes get big and why they're like ninety dollars that's a lot, and then you go through yeah. and ask them, well, how much do you sign up to play this sport? And it's you know anywhere from fifty five to eighty five dollars, 
and it like you tell them like that expense only barely covers your uniforms and it doesn't help pay for your coach and your your team is only a, allowed allotted a certain budget so yeah. um they're they're under informed um but yeah. it's also they i don't want to say i don't want to generalize it but some of them just don't care like they haven't had to care yeah and it, it's a real world coming and yeah i think it's half of don't care and then half of don't know don't mm-hmm. know what i don't know right what i do i just saw a commercial and i don't like commercials but this one is uh i think it's john cena talking for experian how your rental income can now be reported on your credit report mm-hmm. to build up your credit and i was like that's a great commercial like that's sure. just good knowledge for a mass amount of our population which is renting to know yeah. So like, those are things that I'm like, okay, someone out there is listening and I genuinely like this commercial. I don't know much about John Cena. I hope he's a stand-up guy. (laughs) He is. Right, yeah. Yeah. Like the message is just great. I I love that. It wasn't a pharmaceutical commercial. So like that was our, that was also a bonus. But that's like a real life skill that doesn't cost them money. Just like, hey, you're renting. Go get it reported so you can go buy a house. Right. Yep. Do I, I actually rem- really like that they're doing that now. That that that's huge. I think. Yes. Does yep. that- and I tell all of my tenants, like all of your rental income is paid online. You have a receipt. It would be in your best interest to build your credit. Like report that to Experian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Does do you think a lot of people know how recent the credit scores were established? Wasn't if it in the early to mid eighties? I think season two, mid-season, we had somebody come on who just talks about credit scores. But wasn't it, it just was recently established. Like, I, I'm, I don't know why 1988 sticking out in my head. Maybe it's 78 or 82 or 88. But the credit score reporting system was devised or created then. So it's, I mean, relatively 40-ish, new. 40-ish years old. And, you know, our parents grew up, you know, or my parents. I mean, mine are born in the 60s. but. um you know, being going to early, early, uh, 20 year old. And then all of a sudden this gets, I don't know, dropped in their lap. And, you know, we bounced around a lot. We went from rental to rental to rental. And I think mid nineties is when they bought their first house together. So, I mean, that's, you know, they were in their early to mid thirties at that time. So, um, I think people are getting a start sometimes sooner maybe maybe out of luck or their circumstances bring that to them but for that to be as new as it is and then the i don't want to say the stressor of always making sure that your credit is perfect or working towards getting it perfect right but you know like you said you there's some gray area there's some stuff that's going to happen life will hit hard and it's tough. I don't know. Like you, <laughs> there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot to go on. You just lean, that, but... you lean on the education. Hopefully you got that early. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, so... and I'll, I'll fully admit, you know, there was a time where my credit sucked. Um, we actually, oh, yeah. cause I had cancer, we were uninsured and it's like, well, at that point it's done. Just stick a fork in it. <laughs> so we, we actually rebuilt everything from bankruptcy. And, you know, it, I say that because I want to make sure people know that you can build back up. Like even if you make horrible mistakes, whether it be like credit card debt or medical or whatever, don't ever give up because you can rebuild it as long as you focus on it and you truly make it a goal to rebuild it. Yeah, it can be done. And kudos for you for battling back with that. That's fantastic. I know like I always tell and I'm open with it. When I started in real estate, I think within my first year, I was sitting at a credit score of like mid fours with like 30,000 of credit card debt. I was not in a great situation. That was a lot of my motivation of why I do what I do. Um, But I mean, there was a a separation in there. There was job change. There was a kid. So like there was just a bunch of things happening in that moment where I was putting all my eggs in this basket. And I mean, there were... There are some decisions you had to make where maybe the lights don't go on because you're, you're all of your money and all of your effort is into this. So you do, it's not, and that was the one thing I liked about bigger pockets was like, they don't make it rainbows and sprinkles. It's not rainbows and sprinkles. You get into conversations where lending is very hard, where you have to evict tenants, 
or you're sitting in front of city council or judges, you're talking with attorneys, like it's not all warm and fuzzies. Right. Um, but the more that we can educate people, that's the basic reason for this podcast is to educate people, give them resources of how to learn. Um, that's why you're on the board with the the apartment complexes of Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. I'm sure so you can put in policies in place that people can actually digest and take in and use, and then you can teach it to other people. So on that one, and I know we're coming up on an hour, but we didn't even get to talk to you on the board. And I think that's super cool position. So sure. without spilling the beans and letting things out that you can't let out, are there some things on the horizon within Wisconsin and not the bad, maybe the good that you see that you're trying to work on and get uh, put in place? There is there is a fair amount going on right now that we're trying to stay ahead of the curve on. Uh, specifically, if we look back, I think both of you will probably know what I mean when I say the Barada case. So uh, I don't. Land- Can you oh. fill me with that one? Oh, if you're a rental investor, you have to know this. You have to be watching this. So there I'm is- Googling it right now. What was it called again? Barada, but please, I, I, I always spell it wrong. It always takes me a while to Google it, but- a landlord in Milwaukee. Okay. He is the biggest landlord in this in Milwaukee. So he has, I think it's close to or over 8,000 units. Wow. Okay. Now, a little backstory here. He gained the attention of the AG. Um, sorry, lawyer speak, attorney general. <laughs> he gained the attention of the attorney general. The reason he did that was because if you don't know, when a tenant complains, they go to something called the Department of Agricultural Trade and Consumer Protection in Wisconsin. And they are one of the big big departments that administer what we do um so anyway tenants complain to the datcp for short speak the datcp at some point when they start seeing a name come back and back and back they're going to refer to the ag and go hey i think you need to look into this guy so this guy owns eight thousand properties across milwaukee he had more than 500 complaints filed against him from late 2020 through I think the end of 2021. And the huge thing about this is that there is going to be pushback from this because there are two ways that law is made in Wisconsin. First, you have legislators that pass it. So you have state senators and then you have state representatives that pass law that's signed by the governor. The other way law happens is departments make what's called administrative rules. 134 in state statutes is administrative rules put forth by the DATCP. So what can come out of this is both the DATCP and the attorney general can make administrative rules based on everything they found with Barada. Now I'm not saying Barada is a bad person. I'm not here to say that. What I, what I will say about what I view from what he did, he was very robotic in how he ran his properties. And because he owned the property management company, he can't say, oh, it's my property management company that made all these choices. No, dude, you ran the property management company. And yeah. here's what we're already seeing coming out of that. He gave 12 hour notice for repairs. Now, okay, that's totally fine. But the repairs were, I'm going to replace all the windows in your unit. Hmm. I'm giving you 12 hour notice for that. I'm going to redo your bathroom. 12 hour notice for that. You can't do that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and he also like gave 12 hour notice for replacing the mailboxes, but yet the mailboxes were down for like three or four days and tenants couldn't get their mail. So um, we already see some things that are going to come out of this. Late fees. He had what we would call astronomical late fees. Now, nothing else. Well, I mean, if actually... they can't get their paychecks in their mailbox, how are they going to pay their rent? Well, that's a whole different conversation too. <laughs> yes, exactly. See, right. But like his late fees were what any judge would consider exorbitant. You know, not that we have any rules in Wisconsin about how much you can charge, you just can't charge like two fifty if the rent is six fifty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, know, it, it really should be proportional to rent. So if I'm being honest here, we're trying to get ahead of the curve with some of this stuff, so that we can legislate it where it's it still addresses what they want to handle with what happened with Barada, but yet doesn't make it where it constrains us too much. Yeah. So we're talking about creating a bill that has late fees maxed at 10% of the rent. That seems perfectly reasonable. Your rent is 650, yeah. okay, $65. Your rent is 1600, okay, 160. You know, so there's certain ways we're trying to get ahead of the curve so that when the hatchet comes down, it doesn't come down as hard on us as it would be if we weren't trying to get ahead of the curve. 
So we yeah. are trying to actively legislate some things ahead of time on that so that the attorney general, the DATCP can see, all right, well, we've addressed it with you guys here in this. So I think we're good. Because if we're yeah. not a part of this conversation, it's going to end up coming down hard against us. And that's why particularly one thing we do in this organization is lobbying is so important. It's when you get big cases like this, because every single part of being a rental investor will be affected by the time this case is fully adjudicated from security deposits to notices, to late fees, to lease clauses, like you name it. Maybe the only thing that won't be affected is water heater temperature. Not entirely sure, but if you don't know, that is regulated in Wisconsin. But anyway, everything will be affected by it because of just the size of complaints and the diversity of the complaints that came out of this. Wow. Yeah, I have some reading ahead of me today. I wish we had more time because I've got millions of questions on this case. <laughs> but I'm going to read it first. Then we're going to have to have you on. And I think we'll just have a segment of you like within that that board. Because that would be, talk about education. Like that little segment right there was education for me. So I'm sure other investors or people that are getting into investment, take a look at that case and read that too. Because, I mean, you can't get any more real education than that. Yeah. And I know I've talked to people through the agent license and the general contracting license. Taking the test in the classroom and then real world experience are way different playing fields. So getting some learning experience with this one, I'm excited about. I'm going to read that today. Um, man, hopefully there's resolution. And I I don't want to speak bad of the guy, but hopefully he gets educated on an appropriate late fee. Right. I don't and think just... I've ever charged over $25. Oh, wow. That's really low. Maybe I'm wow. doing it wrong. No, I just, I look at it as a, I don't want to make this an income. I want this to be a motivation to pay your bill on. I don't want any late fees. I just want you to pay your bill. That's really what I want. And I don't want to sure. keep I don't want to keep digging you in a hole by late fee on top of late fee on top of late fee because I'm not getting my rent because I'm trying to get late fees. Mm -hmm. So my philosophy on it is a little bit different, but um man, well hopefully I'm I'm intrigued to see what happens with this case. I really I, am. I am too, but this is going to be a long process. This is not something where I I would be surprised if it's fully adjudicated before the end of the year. Oh, really? Yeah. So is it going into 24 for yeah, sure? I, I, I think so. Yes. Cause there's a lot to unpack here for, for the attorney general. Yeah. Man. Is well, he in, in, I guess is a quick question. And if you don't want to answer it, cause it's going to get you in a bind. Is he in jeopardy of losing properties over this? Is this oh, like a, something that can happen? Oh, it can happen. Absolutely. hundred okay. percent, especially at this level. Yes. Man. Well, I'm going to leave a cliffhanger to the, my next question. Because I, I want to see how it plays out and I don't want to put you in the spot, but uh, I'm going to read this case. I think we're going to have you back if you would like and if you can speak on on your like your board duties more because that was fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure we'll run into each other now and we'll grab some lunch here downtown Oconomowoc. I think we can like both great. spare the five minute drive. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, I appreciate your time. Um, what is the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, honestly, you know, I feel you're trying to easily find me on the internet. You got a couple options. Uh, over on Instagram, I have Landlord Chick. Uh, that's where I post about my podcast, Landlord Chick. Uh, I'd like to say that comes out weekly, but I'm a one-man show, so I don't know about that. <laughs> then I'm yeah. also over on Bigger Pockets. Find me, Karina Ufinger. Um, all, all our bets are off. You know, let's say you don't do those things and go on to waaonline.org. You can find me on there because I'm the chairman of the Wisconsin Apartment Association. That's great. And if you're an investor listening to the show, find her on Bigger Pockets. That is going to be your best way, I'm guessing, to get a hold of you. The man, the possibilities of Bigger Pockets is endless. Exactly. Super cool what they've set up. Yeah. But thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for teaching me something. It's only been 10, it's only 10 30. <laughs> well, you're welcome. It's a great conversation to start out with today. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> So enjoy the rest of the day. We will talk to you soon. Uh, and good luck with all the legwork on that case. <laughs> Thank you. It's going to be a long road. <laughs> Thanks for the time. Yeah, You're we'll welcome. talk to you soon. Thanks, Karina. Bye. Bye.